I would never live any other place except in the flower pot subdivision. And that was in 1911 that they purchased the 160 acres. When the farm was purchased, it bordered South Harrison Road and extended from just north of Marigold on the north, west to the river, and south to the railroad tracks. We believe the south border was just south of Seaver Drive. At that time, the champions owned a farm that was now part of ShopRite Center. And it may have extended to the west, including the Hume Farm. The farmhouse was on the corner of Harrison and Marigold. So that was their first residence. Our parents were married in 1916, and by 1918, our father built his house at 818 South Harrison, and that was just south of the farmhouse. I had to think a minute there. The house where the four of us and our siblings were brought up. Well, the first memory that I can remember is my brother and I peddling papers, and we peddled all the way from Michigan Avenue to uh, Mount Hope Road. So we knew the names of every person in that distance. There were only two houses on the east side of uh, Harrison Road, and uh, so there was a big stretch there between the Carters, which was right next to the river, and the people down by the railroad was this open field, and, and the only thing I can remember there was that the only thing they had were horses the house was a former small hotel where the Pierre Marquette and Grand Trunk Railroads crossed. Where two, ra where two railroads crossed, it's called a diamond. There were six of us kids, so we needed a small hotel. The Pierre Marquette had arrived first in the early 1870s. The Grand Trunk, Trunk came through later in that decade, building a depot north of the diamond in 1880, naming it after Charles Trowbridge, a former president of one of the predecessor railroads, and there's a picture of the depot over there. Um, over there. In the early 1900s, George, George Hume was a lever man for Trowbridge. He pulled the signal levers inside the depot. His wife, Nettie, was caretaker of the depot. They had a farm a few routes north of the railroad, now the Ivanhoe subdivision. Sometime in the 1930s, the depot was replaced with a control tower, and George Hume worked one of the shifts at the tower. And there's a picture of the tower over there. South from the tower across the tracks was a pond. Carlton Selhorn would bring his kayak, and we would take turns floating it. There is an empty space among the Spartan Village buildings there now where they couldn't build because it was wet. <laughs> Towards Mount Hope was our small ski hill along what is now the freeway. But my favorite sport was train watching. From the titles on the boxcar, my brother Bob and I knew the name of every railroad in the country, although we didn't know where they were. Our favorite train was express number 41 that came from the east around eight each evening. It was pulled by engine 1224, a type known as a Berkshire. I thank you very much. And we thank you, Fred. And we have a little something for Fred. Fred's a very special person, so join in. 
Fred, before you leave, we do have something here for you. A plaque from the Red Cedar Community Association with deep appreciation and gratitude. We recognize Fred Kletke, longtime resident, good neighbor, and friend to all, October 4th, 2007. I want to talk about three areas um, of space that really defined my childhood. The first one I'm going to talk about is an area that's gone. It's the fields that are where the 496, 127 interchange is now. That freeway construction started in 1962, but for five years I had the delightful privilege of, of playing in those fields, of digging holes in the gravel pits, sledding down hills, catching tadpoles, walking in echo pipe, doing all the kinds of wonderful things that you read about maybe in Huckleberry Finn. And it's amazing to me to think that I was lucky enough to have those kinds of experiences here growing up. Uh, we even uh, helped put out fires that trains started, and for good measure, I once started a grass fire myself back in those fields. Um, the second place I want to talk about is the playground for this school, because the playground for this school, after the fields were gone particularly, became a very important place for me, a very important space for me, and for the other kids, mostly boys, but not all boys, uh, for after school and weekend recreation. Almost every day after school, there would be a pickup football game, basketball games on the blacktop, or else softball in the spring and summer. It was wonderful to have these facilities so nearby. You could walk home, get a snack after school, come back and play for a couple of hours, and then go home. It was really terrific, and you got to meet a lot of kids that way, and these were unsupervised sports, so we had to sort of make our own refing decisions. But this is something for Janet, so she'll remember us, some mums that she can plant in her garden. And there is, plus, there's a little thing, because this is from, Liz got this, from the Centennial Committee. It's a little, you can open it. Um, it's a little tile about East Lansing Centennial. And it's a Pawabic tile. Yeah. And... <laughs> Part of the reason we decided to do this was it because it was East Lansing Centennial, and Mr. Hicks started his farm in 1911, so I wasn't sure how many people would be around till then, so we thought it might be a good time to do this. <laughs> so it's all worked out really nicely, so thank you all. As we walked, uh, from Oodles of Noodles over here, the church played for the beauty of the earth. And I thought, how appropriate, because we're in a beautiful spot of the earth tonight. We've seen a lot of people come and go. And um, some of them say they wish they hadn't left. This is one of the nicest neighborhoods that I know of. <laughs> 